Welcome to Health Activators with lifestyle medicine doctor, GP and longevity expert, Dr. Alka Patel. This show will help you to discover a hidden health hacking code that unlocks your phenomenal potential for an outstanding health span, lifespan and wealth span. The show features candid conversations with celebrities, influencers and industry icons, real life stories and cutting edge health activating advice that other doctors might not tell you. Discover why now is the time to join the strategic self-care revolution and experience the profound effects this will have on your personal and professional success. Now, here is your host, Dr. Alka Patel. Before we get into today's show, please do support today's show partner, Youth and Earth. Youth and Earth have a range of products that I love to use myself to supercharge my metabolism, to support my health and to slow down cellular aging. Just be sure you click the link in the show notes for exclusive offers, which Youth and Earth are so generously giving for listeners of this show. Hi, hey, and hello, health activators. On today's show, I have with me Kelly Mathiason, who you'll probably know best for her role as the amazing Christine Dale on Phantom of the Opera. Now, Kelly is an incredibly talented actress and singer and dancer and performer. And today, what we're talking about is how her career impacted on her relationship with food. Hey, Kelly, welcome, welcome to the show. So good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Oh, this is going to be such a such a great conversation. I already know it. So where should we start? So I would love to know how you got to doing what you're doing right now. You know, you're in the theater, you're in in the arts, you're immersed in, in singing. Tell us how it all began. Yeah, it's a good question, actually, um, because I don't come from a musical family whatsoever, um, as much as they like to think they are. Um, But I started dancing very young, um, from three years old, and everything kind of unfolded from there. Um, I moved to London when I was around 17, 18 to come study at the Royal College of Music. And my journey took off very, very quickly yeah. after I left there. I kind of had a couple of years in the opera world and then I went into musical theatre and it all just went a bit mental from there. So it's been amazing. Um, it's been a long journey and a hard journey. Um, it's a difficult industry, an extremely difficult industry, but I, I love it. I love it at times. It's great. <laughs> oh, and, you know, we don't really kind of see the difficult part in front of what goes on behind the scenes in, in terms of what you on the stage, what we tend to see is the kind of the beautiful voice and the glamour of being on stage. So when you say it's a difficult industry, what do you mean? I mean, loads of people obviously know it's a very competitive industry. Um, that's an understatement. Um, there's a lot that comes with it. Um, a lot of, you know, mental health issues as well, because I think what people forget is that it's not, it's not glitz and glamour. It's a lot of sweat and tears and it's, it's a job where you can't really switch off and nobody really knows who they are without it. I mean, COVID was a prime example when loads of us just had a complete and utter, you know, personality check where we were like, who are we? I have no clue who I am without the stage. I mean, I was doing Phantom of the Opera at the time in the West End. And, you know, I was in that building for two and a half years and that's that's all I knew um and then when that was taken away from me I was like I have no clue who I am without the stage I have no clue who I am without this role Mm. um so it is a difficult industry you know you never you never switch off people have to remember that this this is our life and we are we are the instrument Mm. and we are the art um so every single day is about feeding ourselves for the arts, mm-hmm. exercising ourselves for the arts. You know, there's never anything just for ourselves. It's like, it's it's hard to stop. It's hard to give ourselves mm-hmm. a break. I find that really sad to hear as you're saying that, Kelly, because it's sort of this missing identity piece because, you know, we always talk about authenticity and bringing yourself to everything that you're doing. Do you sometimes feel that you're hiding behind this mask can this stage be a place to sort of hide yourself because I I find a lot of people say very similar things they don't really know who they are that sense of being alone with themselves having some solitude to discover what makes me function 
Where do I light up? What matters to me? Many, many people don't go through that discovery journey. And, and COVID, as you quite rightly say, kind of forced many of us into, into that. But tell me about that identity piece from, from your angle as a, as a performer. Is it, is it a mask? And where do you allow yourself to, to shine through? Yeah, do you know what? I'm I'm really happy to to talk about this because I think a lot of people think that I'm like this extrovert and I'm always on show and I'm like always laughing and always making a joke and stuff, but I'm actually quite shy as a person. Um but when you are within that industry, you know, you have to be confident all the time. You have to walk into a room and be like an addition room and like I'm here and I'm so ready and hi how are you but then really you're crippling inside and you're kind of like oh did I do that wrong like did I shake their hand weird like should I should I do this should I say that what did I say mm. and then sometimes when you're with people you don't know you know it's it's hard it's hard to be yourself because sometimes you don't know who you actually are. Mm. And then as soon as someone mentions, oh, they're, they're a performer and they just want to know everything about it. And then suddenly you feel like you switch on where if someone kind of just put me in a room with people that I have no clue who, who I am, you know, sometimes you have to go to these events, press events and all that stuff. Yeah. Sometimes you don't know what to say unless someone talks about your job. And that's really difficult because you're kind of like, well, who am I then? Like, I, I don't have a clue what else to talk about. I don't think I'm a boring person. You know, I have loads of friends and loads of hobbies and all of that stuff, but there's only certain people that I truly feel I can a hundred percent be myself around. And then sometimes I just have no clue who I am mm -hmm. otherwise, mm -hmm. which is kind of a hard thing to admit, but it's the truth. No. And I'm so glad that you're, you are able to share that here and, and say that out loud because it's something that is, I think the more people that hear that and say that, the more space you give to kind of recognizing that it is important to, to kind of take off that mask. Um, because otherwise there are, there are consequences. I like have for you when you were kind of faced with those, those challenges off stage, when you weren't wearing your mask, when you weren't performing, being somebody else, being what the script said, how did that challenge? How did you navigate that? How did that show up for you? It's just, it's a, it's a challenge continually. It just keeps going. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, your whole energy is on that stage. Um, and sometimes when you're doing a role for so long, you actually don't really know who you are without that role. And you start, I mean, a lot of people talk about method acting, right? right. So like actually being the character, I, I never, I never take it that far, but you know, you do sometimes start feeling yourself kind of becoming a little internal and not really understanding who you are without this. Mm -hmm. um, and co COVID was, was the moment I truly was, I was so confused. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. so confused. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. Yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was a tough time for the industry, wasn't it? Very, very much so. I mean, yeah. certainly when I've talked to people about navigating through stress or when they're facing that sort of identity crisis or almost that sort of imposter syndrome that you've just described there and, and that perfectionism in your in your trade what I've noticed as well is a lot of people do turn to what feels like an easy fix so the drugs and the alcohol and the addictions and the lack of self-care and the kind of neglecting yourself did that show up for you in any form or any guise because it can show up in in many many ways yeah, I think sometimes you, that kind of stuff comes with like a sense of like trying to control something because you feel like everything else is out of control. Mm -hmm. um, I've never had a problem with alcohol or drugs or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I've admittedly have a, had a severe problem with food um, and, you know, stuff that still stays in my life to this day. And like that kind of stuff does creep up within performing. You know, a lot of um, performers struggle with it. There was a BBC documentary that just came out about the ballet schools recently mm -hmm. and, um, you know, body dysmorphia, body mm -hmm. shaming, everything like that. But that's that's kind of what you start to battle with in, in those times, trying to, trying, trying to control something. And we will always find something to control because the industry is so out of control, <laughs> out of our hands, um, that we always try to hold on to something. Mm. 
And what was that like sort of growing up, I guess? How long has that kind of association with food and that relationship been with food been with you, would you say? Did it come when you reached that peak of, I say peak, but, you know, you're obviously still growing, but the peak of, God, look, you know, I'm here, I'm in phantom and I, you know, I'm in front of all these crowds and I'm doing amazing, incredible things and getting amazing, amazing compliments. And yet off stage, it might feel very different for me. Like, what was that like kind of just suddenly that rise to fame um, as well? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, the, the, the the success the fame as you would say was overnight and it was hard um I had to grow up very quickly um I feel I got this role very out of the blue when I ended up going into phantom um I didn't really think it was going to happen to me but it did and I just that was hard you know like because so, I didn't even have social media at the time you know I, I didn't have Instagram or anything and um I had to restart all of that and suddenly everyone is saying something to you continually. Yeah. Um, my journey with food, I mean, that all happened when I was studying, you know, it's a, a pressurizing industry to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it actually happened when I'd come off of a pill and all my weight basically dropped and then suddenly everyone was making comments. Now it's never, what I'm finding is that, and this is what happens is that when people lose weight, nobody's like, you know, you look a little thin. People are like, you look amazing. Right. You look so good. Like, what is your secret? Like, are you just not eating? And then, and then you would sit down to dinner and like, maybe someone might not serve you as much as your friend because they're like, well, clearly she's not eating anything. Mm. It heightened badly in Phantom, for sure. Um, again, I lost weight naturally. You know, I was doing, a, you know, my entire weeks were shows. Um, and I didn't really have that much time to eat in a way. And I think my adrenaline was so high that I kind of forgot to eat. And then suddenly I would drop so much weight. And again, it started with you look incredible. Like you look amazing. Then suddenly my costumes were all having to get taken in. Then that became a thing of, oh, she's just got so skinny. And like, how do you do it and stuff? And then when you start to realize what's happening, you start taking control. Mm. So it ended up being, I wouldn't eat lunch ever. I would wake up in the morning and have a bit of breakfast. I wouldn't eat lunch. I'd go into theater. I'd have a coffee. That was my dinner. That was my dinner. I went to Pret and I got a coffee and I would go to work. I'd do a show and that would be my food for the day. And then it started, I knew I was doing that. And then that became like an obsessive thing. I was, I mean, I'm five foot seven, you know, I'm not, I'm not small. Yeah. I'm quite tall for, for a woman, but I was under like, I was like seven and a half stone reaching on to seven stone. I mean, I was really wow. thin Um but it's hard, you know, people, I would have people come up to stage door in between shows and, and ask me on a double show day and be like, are you, are you like someone I don't know, are you going to go get some food? Mm. And I'd be like, well, yeah, it's in between shows. Cause you look like you need to eat, mm. like you need, you need food. And I'd be like, you don't know me, yeah. you don't know me. And then as soon as someone commented on my weight, I would then fixate on it and I'd be like even though someone just told me I look ill yeah I'm like oh maybe maybe I shouldn't go eat and then I just wouldn't eat because I because someone had commented so therefore someone looked at me so therefore I was triggered mm. Mm -hmm. it's hard it's complex isn't it just you kind of what you're describing there in itself is complex because on the one hand you've got well don't tell me I look amazing when I've lost weight and on the other hand, don't tell me I look ill and unwell when I've lost weight. And so it's get, it's really that association with the meaning of the words that you're hearing that's the most important thing. And you're right. It's like, why do we take to heart immediately what someone says about our weight? There's such an emotion attached to it. There's such a relationship attached to it. And there's more than that. There's such a stigma now attached to it as well. So... What do you think needs to be different? I mean, when you look at figures, there's over a million, 1.4 million, I think, was the last count of, of people in the UK who have just been diagnosed with anorexia. 
itself and we're not even talking about those that haven't been diagnosed and i think that the staggering number that i found was about 4000 children this is age between 5 and 10 what are we doing wrong what do you think needs to be different kelly i mean social media is 100% behind it um that's the difficulty in terms of performers we are trained to be fit and healthy but then it's within our mind to be to be thin basically dancers have a horrible time um you know you're continually told to be thinner you're continually told to go on diets um same goes for musical theater we've been told to go on diets i know someone that basically was told if they didn't go to the gym they couldn't get the job and they had to prove wow. that they had to lose this amount of weight and this person's not overweight this this wasn't even like a role that had to be like topless or anything like that this is just a normal role um, who's, telling, for, who's telling you this? Producers, um, casting people, you know, these are people we want to work with, people and, that we And now, respect. we're not talking, you know, 20 years ago, right now. Mm, mm. Wow. I'm flabbergasted. Yeah. I really am because it doesn't need to happen anymore. It doesn't need to happen. There's enough information. There's enough visibility. There's enough conversation. But then maybe there isn't if this is still happening. No, I don't think there is. Um, I think everything's edited online now. You know, I have no clue what someone looks at, actually looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. We fixate on, especially nowadays, we fixate on beauty. That everything is everything is ex accessible. You know, mm -hmm. you can you can go next door to your nearest like dentist, and they'll give you Botox and they'll give you fillers and. You know, they'll do anything for you and everything is about being smaller, thinner, you know, all of that stuff for guys, bigger. You have to be bigger. You have to be more muscular. You have to look like this. You know, this is another thing. It's not just females. And actually the person I'm talking about that got told how to go to the gym was a male. You know, this isn't, this isn't just about females. Yeah. It's, it's everyone. And it's, I don't know what can be done because we have to be more aware of the conversation. You can't do this to people. It's one comment will trigger someone for life. I mean, I've had this ongoing battle since I was 20 years old, maybe. And I'm, you know, it's, it's a while now that it's been going on. Right. Right. And I think that is, I think you've raised two really, really important points there. One is raising the male profile as well. Again, we associate, eating issues, eating disorders, relationships with food, image with females. Um, but absolutely, you know, it's, it's there in the male world. And I love the way that you've described it about, you know, being smaller versus being bigger. Um, and there is this, and it, you know, that it's, it's partly the fault of the wellness industry itself, which has just kind of rocketed out of all proportion to the gym is the place that you go to, to look good and supplements and pills are what you take to look good. And they've got a place, but you know, in the real world, like you don't need to go to a gym to exercise. You need to move about and play with your, with your nieces and nephews and, and run around in the, in the gardens and get the cricket bats out in the, in the summer, right? And get down on your hands and knees and cuddle your dogs. And that's kind of, you know, where you're getting your physicality from. Um, in the real world, you shouldn't need a plate full of supplement. It's just eating colorful, bright food and spending time with your families to eat rather than isolated one hand on sandwich, one hand on desk or in your own rooms, in your changing rooms where, where you are. So it's that big thing that needs to shift, isn't it? For, for people to understand like how to be around people. And yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so hard. So where are you at now with you and food? You said it's something that's still there for you. In what way? How does it show up? Yeah, I mean, COVID again triggered it. Um, I think COVID triggered it because I wasn't doing as many shows. Therefore, I was like, oh my God, like I'm actually going to have to eat. Um, and I also went into lockdown with my now ex-boyfriend and, you know, he would be more in control of, of my food intake. Um, 
because he would cook and, you know, therefore I had to eat um, and I couldn't get out of it. Um, I got quite thin again during COVID, but then it went the opposite direction. And it, again, it was a control and it was binge eating. Um, and I would go into the kitchen and run a tap and eat food because I didn't want my ex to hear me eating. Um, you know, I would go get food when I was out and not tell him. Um, I obviously gained a lot of weight during that, that time as well, um, which was hard for me mentally, um, especially because all my clothes were so small. Um, started not being able to fit into anything. Um, now I would say I'm in a much better place. Um, you know, I... But you... It's, I, I never feel it fully leaves you. You know, I don't, I don't not think about food. Um, I'm always very aware of what I'm eating. Mm. Um, I most of the time would try go for fewer calories in a meal than I would just enjoying my meal. Um, the menus at restaurants really trigger me as well. Um, but I don't feel awful you know I'm very accepting of my body now I've, I've accepted that I'm older and that my body is going to change mm. um and you know all of that stuff so I exercise for fun now but for my mental health right. for sure right. rather than oh my god I ate a chocolate bar last night I need to go run right you know I would eat a chocolate bar go for a 10k run then go to spin class and then I would go do a show you know it was mental mm. because for one chocolate bar you know it was crazy times but now you know I'm much better for sure mm. um but I I I would love a day when I don't fully think about it <laughs> yeah. yeah and have you ever reached out for professional support in any of this or is it something you've just sort of right I'll raise my self-awareness I'll try and change my relationship I'll look for help just around me with my with my boyfriends my partners or have you have you ever thought about reaching out for professional help yeah of course mm -hmm. um I use the beat charity um is I spoke to them quite a lot I think when I was really early 20s I had to call them quite a lot um if I had an episode and they were great um I've had therapy, um, you know, I've, I've, I've done everything that I physically can. Um, but I just think as a performer, it just, it does kind of just stay with you. And I think, I think it's the same with the models. I think it's the same with people in sport. Mm -hmm. Um, I think people, I mean, I know for sure in rugby, you know, they get weighed and, you know, have to get folds and all that stuff. But like, um for us we don't get weighed we just kind of get judged yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um but yeah much 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 better for sure yeah. um I've never felt like I've had to call a friend or anything recently at all no that's that's really good to hear and I think good for people listening to hear in that reaching out for support is something people are often very reluctant to do because it makes it real as well and you can't hide anymore as well but I think you here just sharing that I've picked up the phone to this incredible charity and got support from beat when I when I've needed it and this idea of having therapy again gets so stigmatized but a place to and a space to just be able to say and feel and acknowledge and understand is probably un undoubtedly what therapy gave you to be able to now be in a place where Yes, it might feel as though it's not leaving you, but your awareness is so much more heightened. So your choices are going to be automatically different as a result. Yeah. And what do you think, Kelly, about weighing then? Do you have, what do you think about people having scales in their bathroom? Yeah, for me, it's a no go. Mm -hmm. Absolute no go. I'm so against them. Um, if, if my ex had ever brought them in, um, I would freak out, completely and utterly freak out. If I would go into a bathroom, I would freak out. Someone else's bathroom, there's scales there, my heart rate will go through the roof because I'm like, do I stand on it? Do I not? Mm -hmm. Like, And, you know, um, I'm so against weighing. I'm so against it. Unless you are going on one of those, like, 
you know, very high tech machines where you're having to get everything fully scanned that can give you a complete layout Mm -hmm. of your body fat, of your muscle, of everything. And you are using that to a, to, for, for a good thing. Like you need to use it and you're in the right mental space to do Mm -hmm. it. A hundred percent go for it. For me, I'm like, no, it has to go by how you feel. You know, we all know about the whole ratio with muscle and fat, but you can't stand on a scale and and, and define your day by the number on it. Like mm-hmm. it changes so much. Like I'm so against it. Yeah, yeah. And yet somehow weight has become the number. Um, and as you you know quite rightly described, it's it, there's so much more to it. But it's the intention with which you use data and information about yourself. And I think you know you're right from a health perspective. There are many numbers that are super useful to us to to track and keep an eye on and understand what we're doing and how it's how things are affecting us. But only if you use them with that purpose. Like, what's the goal here? What's the reason? What's the reason for standing on these scales? And if the reason is to ends up being it freaks me out to decide if I'm going to eat this chocolate or throw up in the sink, then that's not a that is not a good reason to be standing on those scales. Right. So and you mentioned um, exercise as well um, and also wanting to do things for fun. So tell me about exercise and fun. And more specifically, I, I know you've got something coming up. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm I I love exercise. I really enjoy it. Um, I like to keep fit. I love the feeling afterwards. I think I'm very aware if I don't exercise, how my mood kind of goes down. Mm. Um, so I love to to keep on top of it. Um, you know, I have my Peloton bike. I have, you know, I love lifting weights. That was another thing I would refuse to do years ago because I thought that I was going to get bulky and I can't do that. And, Mm -hmm. but then I started adding in weights, which was, you know, a game changer for me. Um, I've always been a runner. I like running, but, uh, yeah, I'm running the London marathon next year, which I'm really looking forward to (laughs) said with sarcasm. Yeah. And I can say Um, that again. (laughs) I know. I know. Um, yeah, I'm running, finally running it. I was supposed to run it in 2020, but um, obviously that got cancelled. Um, so I'm finally running it next year for Crohn's UK um, for my friend Rob, um, which I felt I really wanted to do. There was a few charities I wanted to run for, mm-hmm. one being Beat, actually. Um, but just with everything my friend's been through over the past, well, I want to say a year, but it's been basically his life. But the past year has been really tough. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm going to do that for him next year, hopefully raise as much money as I can. But it also just gives me a really good excuse to have a good plan with running and exercise and, and get stronger. That's something that's really important to me not not about you know burning the calories it's about getting stronger so I can get through it on a good time and you know actually do it yeah amazing well look firstly hello to Rob (laughs) and um and it's an amazing charity to for you to be able to um, support as well I think Crohn's is very misunderstood um, Uh. as well and there are you know approaches to to taking care of it to managing it to getting rid of it uh sometimes get kind of left on the on the table um and so there's a lot that you know i'm I'm really glad in terms of your kind of um zoning in on this for your for your run and really being able to support the the charity to be able to kind of just help more people with it because it is very possible to really improve lives um through through some of the work that you're looking at doing and i think it's really nice to hear you talking about the marathon and running and the training and the run up to it and wanting to make sure that you kind of do that with the right mindset and it's not just about train 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 but again i want to get strong through this Mm. because ultimately that is you know what exercise gives us it's it's strength and i'm not talking about oh yeah you know that kind of strength it's 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 strength that we need in our bones and in our muscles to keep us upright to let us do the things that that we love so that you know as we get older that strength stays with you we lose so much muscle mass even from the age of 30 that muscle mass um starts to be lost so when you want to you want to maintain that strength um and that flexibility and that agility as well so um so no really really excited for you (laughs) 
<laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, and what else have you got coming up in the pipeline as well, Kelly? Yeah, so I'm currently in London right now. I've been away uh, for a little while working. Um, it's been a busy year. I've been all over the place, but so far I've done two West End shows this year. Um, some regional stuff. Um, and now I'm in London back for audition series and um, some concerts coming up, which is exciting. Um, it's a very unpredictable industry, very last minute industry. So you never know what's going to happen, but so far so good. It's been, it's been a nice year. Oh. Oh, wonderful. I love hearing about that. And look, you are so talented. And, you know, anyone who has seen you performing will 100% have a very strong lasting memory of, of that. Um, so thank you for everything that you do um, on that stage. And, you know, in terms of your performance, and also beyond that, everything that you are, I think you shed so much on this show by allowing yourself to be you. So where you came on talking about a mask and not knowing who you are, I have to say thank you so much for sharing what you've been mm -hmm. through because your conversation, what you shared about your relationship with food, I think is going to resonate with with many listeners. And, and so what would you say to someone listening who says, yeah, you know what, me, food, the eating patterns you've described, you know, that's that's me. What would you say to someone who's feeling they, they don't know what to do next? I think the best thing to do is to fully recognize that it's happening. Um, these eating patterns are not always to do with being skinny. And like, this is the ignorance towards it is that people think it's just about being thin, wanting to be thin. It's, it's not about that. Nobody wants to lose their periods and their hair falls out and they can't get out of bed. Like nobody wants that. Um, but help is there and beat is there and talk about it. Find people that will you know, take you in and understand um, and be honest about it because there are so many people that are going through this that you don't, you don't know about. And it's amazing when you talk to people that, that they feel the same way and mm. um, that it truly is okay to feel this way and that genuinely you can get to the other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Ab absolutely. If you're listening, you know, you're not alone is the first thing to say no. and this will change is the second thing and you can reach out for help i'll put the links to beat um in the show notes as well i think that will be um will be great for people and also for for crones uk to support you and, and what yeah. you're about to embark on so i was there last year running that marathon i know what's in store oh, are you? <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Um, oh, oh God. no I'm super super excited for you look thank you so much for our conversation today really appreciate and love everything that you do my pleasure thank you that was such an important conversation to have I'm still pretty shocked though at the stark threats and control and hold that the entertainment industry seems to have in relation to the weight and appearance of very talented performers so next week, I'll explore this further. I'll look at what contributes to your relationship with food, both short term and long term. I mean, we all have a love language in the same way we all have a food language. So I'll get into ways that you can change your food language to create a better relationship with food. In the meantime, of course, as always, I wish you a health activating day. <laughs>